Hello, today we're going to look at chapter 20, Diseases of the Digestive System, and this corresponds to chapter 11 in the ICD-10 CM codebook. The first thing I want to do is review some terms that are part of this chapter. It's important that you know the difference between diverticulum, diverticulitis, and diverticulosis. Be sure that you have a clear understanding of those differences. The biliary system and a calculus or a stone are things you're frequently going to be coding in an acute care setting. A J tube and a G tube are feeding tubes that are placed into the body for patients who have difficulty taking in enough nutrition, whether that would be because of illness or an injury to the esophagus, um, if they're on a ventilator, they need more calories than they can eat to keep up with all the demands that the body has. So for different reasons, patients have these tubes inserted. I did find something on the web that I want to share with you. This shows you a uh, G-tube means it goes in the stomach, gastrostomy, often called a peg tube. And then the J-tube J is for jejunum, which is a section of the small intestine, and that's called a PEG, P-E-J tube. So you have PEG and a PEG. When I was working in the hospital, typically it was the G tube that I saw the most frequently, but I think it would depend on the, on the physician and what was wrong with the patient, whether or not the feeding tube was placed in the stomach or the intestine. Esophagitis and esophageal pharises are two terms. It's important that you understand the differences. Esophagitis is the inflammation of the lining of the esophagus, and esophageal pharises is referring to the veins in the lower part of the esophagus. If you look in the back of your code book, on, in the illustration that says veins, we can see that. And you see here I'm on the veins and here's the esophageal vein which is just under the diaphragm. The diaphragm goes across this part of the body. When we take a breath that's what we feel moving up and down about this mid thorax and the esophageal vein becomes very enlarged especially in certain um, like for example alcoholics will very often have esophageal varices where they have a very large um, esophageal vein and if this vein burst a patient can bleed out pretty quickly and it can kill them. So you will frequently be coding esophageal varices if you're working in a hospital. Here's more terms to know that are related to GI bleeding. Hematemesis, melena, occult bleeding, and hematochesia or chesia. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Be sure you know what those terms mean. You will often see them in the chart related to GI bleeding. If you are documenting hemorrhaging related to an ulcer or a GI bleed and a hemorrhaging of an ulcer, these are integral. In other words, of course, someone is going to have blood in their stool if they're bleeding out of an ulcer. So you're not going to code those. They are considered integral to the condition. But still, you need to know what they mean and when you may or may not use them. You may remember in previous lectures, we have coded complications using the T-codes. When you get to the digestive system, you are coding the complication of an artificial opening, not a T-code. It's a K94 code. I'm going to go through some of these exercises rather quickly because you can review the PowerPoints, you can review the podcast that will be posted in the, on the content page. I want to spend more time on those exercises that are not in the coding handbook that I think we should discuss. This one talks about a complication of a J-tube. A complication is considered a malfunction when it's clogged right here. This is a right direct inguinal and a left indirect sliding inguinal and the point I want you to understand with this is if you notice all these non-essential modifiers that come after inguinal, direct, external, funicular, indirect, internal, oblique, scrotal, and sliding all have the same slide, uh, same slide, the same 
code, they are non-essential modifiers. So the fact that this is talking about a right and a left inguinal hernia, that's a bilateral hernia. So by looking at your non-essential modifiers, you now know what your code is. That's kind of a trick question. Reflux esophagitis secondary to a sliding esophageal hiatal hernia. Really, esophageal hiatal is kind of um, redundant there because it can be an esophageal. They mean the same thing. Here is the pathway to code this one. Here's something a little bit longer. And I did want you to note ascites, the accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity, and to bring to your mind that we can always go in using the word and a colon in the Google search engine. And this gives us this where we can actually hear the pronunciation of the word. Ascites. Good way to learn medical terminology and know how to pronounce it. I have the pathway here. You see they use additional codes both times. This particular use additional code is related back to the K70 category, and you see we have two codes in the K70 category. So really, even though you have the instructional note, you're only going to use that F10.288 once. Here's the complication of the gastrostomy. I've walked you through the pathway here of how you would get this answer. And for exercise 20.4 number 7, I have the pathway here that gets you to these codes. You see here that the path for the streptococcal infection is a little bit different than we've done in the past. So it's a good idea if you can't find a more specific code you want to keep looking. For example, this description here is just streptococcal. The group B is not included. You've got to look under the main term streptococcal with the subterm group B to get to the B95.1, which is a more specific code.